This episode of Decide to Do It is brought to you by the Rebel Film Festival and Bronson Creative. Hello, hello, and welcome to the podcast. Uh, today I have Gregory Blair with me. Hi, Gregory. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. Uh, Gregory is an actor, director, a writer. Um, I gaffed one of his previous feature films, Garden Party Massacre, um, which we'll talk about probably, I'm sure we'll get into at some point. Uh, but yeah, thanks for coming out today. It's, uh, it's, I think it's been probably like a year since we've seen each other in person. Possibly. Yeah. Or did we, was there, wh- when was the Garden Party Massacre screening that I saw you at? I think that was last fall, right? The one in Burbank? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Fall, yeah, fall yeah. December, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah. kind of cold. Yeah, you're right. So, um, but yeah, it's good to see you. Uh, this this podcast has been bringing people back together, which has been nice. That's like, cool. All the people I haven't seen in a while, and um, it's been great to to catch up and uh, get to hear everything they're working about. It sounds like you're really busy right now. We've we've tried to <laughs> we've tried to schedule this back and forth for like three weeks, and we're yeah. finally here. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, amen. Huh? Yeah, uh, <laughs> mostly mostly acting, right? And, in other people's projects. Yeah, this yeah, this fall is it's almost all uh acting related. Um if I leave next week for Kentucky okay. uh to shoot Beast of the Field, uh which is a, an action adventure thriller, a little bit of a horror bend to it. Um and then uh and I'll come back uh I have a showcase I'm doing and then I'm going to the world premiere of Fang in New York. Which I'm really looking forward to. That's a legit uh, old-fashioned horror film. Nice. And then uh, November, I shoot Robo Woman, which is a sci-fi revenge flick. And then we'll see what happens in December. At the moment, nothing. <laughs> okay. Well, it'll be Christmas time. Maybe it'll be time to take a break. Could be. Yeah. I always like to take like three weeks off and just get out of town in December, especially after a crazy year. But uh, right. But yeah, I'm glad we could find a couple minutes to sit down and talk. I had some questions about you. Um, about kind of like your process of how um, when you're as a director, um, basically our audience is a lot of filmmakers that are either making their first feature or okay. kind of bridging that gap between the shorts and features. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I just had some questions about distribution and all that kind of stuff. And basically, you know, we'll use Garden Party Massacre, I think is kind of our reference point because that's what okay. we work to work sure. on together. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, so... A first-time filmmaker, um, which you are not, but uh, going forward, how would you know what was kind of the process of getting something like Garden Party off the ground? Uh, well, Garden Party was <clears throat> because it wasn't my first film; it was easier. Uh, I think that's that's the first thing I would tell everybody who's a first-time filmmaker: is the first time is probably going to be your hardest, so don't worry that much about it. The first one was very hard. It'll get me. it'll <laughs> get easier as you go along for lots of reasons. You'll learn your you'll learn a lot of lessons. You'll have more people that you know that have skills that you need. It just gets it gets easier the more you've experience stuff and the more you've done the more people you know blah 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 so flexing that muscle yeah totally so if you've made a short you've already probably made some of your mistakes and learned some of your lessons and have some people so it's already if you've done that going to make making your feature just a little bit easier than someone who just dives in and does a feature first thing like i did (laughs) yeah i'd only maybe done two short films and then was like i'm done with those (laughs) Yeah, so you know, because the 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 elements are all the same whether you're making long form or short form. You still you need all the same people and yada yada yada. So um what was your question? <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> so how did um, with like Garden Party? Because I know it was it was still low budget, right? Um, that wasn't self financed though, right? Did you have some Not financiers entirely. behind you? Some, okay. Um, and so whenever somebody is trying to bring in financiers, what is what is kind of that game that they should be prepared for? Well, it, it really sort of varies depending on, um, the struct, a, the structure you're going to set up and b your budget. I mean, when we're talking big budget films, there's a whole different way you have to go about it. Um, if you're going to actually go for, uh, traditional investing, then you've got to get a portfolio together and you're going to go out and you're going to pitch and that sort of thing. Um, basically structuring your film as a business. Exactly. Well, you do that anyway. I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna have an LLC to protect yourself. You're gonna, it, it is a business and you have to treat it that way. Um, or you'll get into trouble. Um, 
like with if I can backtrack to yeah. the revisions of my yeah we can use that film. one too is um yeah because that well, was your first film yeah Be- well because with that one um one of the things that I did was I just sort of approached pe- some people that I knew that I knew were at a higher level income level than I who I could talk to and say hey I would like to da 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 and like for example I got one corporate sponsorship and it was basically they're getting their name in the film because there are a lot of people who still today have this idea that, you know, the film business is glamorous and ooh, they want to see their name on the screen. And that's enough to give you money. You know what I mean? You've had that, that be just enough. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and that, that's, uh, you know, it's not the same thing as crowdfunding, although that has been a traditional perk in crowdfunding, saying, oh, you'll get your name in the movies. But it, instead of doing it with a crowd, you're sp- going after specific targets. And you're saying, hey, this person, this person, this company, whatever. And so that's a one a way of doing it. And so I've done that. And, um, and then, yes, traditional investing. So with the corporate sponsorship, so you did that on Deadly Revisions. Right. And how did that work? Because aren't there some rules with, like, SAG of – of doing of like actors being almost representatives of that company. Isn't there some, some things in their, their contract? I, well, I didn't do a uh, deadly revision SAG, so okay. I can't answer that. Okay. Or the answer is probably yes. Cause, because yeah, there are like, so many well, rules. I looked at like the SAG ULB, the new contract. And basically I think it's if, yeah, if you're bringing in like branding and things like that, there's something of the pay structure because you're basically kind of a commercial almost. If like somebody's holding a Coke. In oh, right, right, or, right. Yeah. If you have, if there's any kind now of. now they're like a spokesperson for that brand. Totally different thing, right? Okay. Like for, in Dead Revisions, it was just credit. So that wasn't the same issue as okay, so if they putting... actually, if I actually held up a cup yeah. from that company, that yeah. would have been a different thing. Okay. So so just in the end, it just was like the logo of a company, and they were basically paying you for an advertisement in the credits. That's it. Yeah. So and I mean, that's so that's super easy. That, yeah, that somebody would be interested in that. Well, like I said, I think there are there are people who just think it's cool. Um, I, really, we can so have that our one name. Was almost just like a straight buyout. That wasn't even like pay them back. No, not that at was all. Just an advertising. It was credit. totally like an advertising credit. So uh, first time filmmakers, go go to your friends dads, whoever's got a, you know, if there's a, a car dealership or a, whatever it is, you can approach them, say, look, I'm making a film, da, 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 da. I'm looking for corporate sponsorships, uh, you can get your name in the credits, uh, blah, 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 and just pitch it yeah, like I've that. Yeah, I've used it as, like, getting free locations before. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. Like, I've done it, but I've never thought you'd just go up and ask for just, like, straight cash. <laughs> well, you, uh, you actually, you can present it in, uh, give them give them the options. Yeah. Say, what I'm looking for is da-da-da-da-da, and I say, I've got some people that are giving me locations, uh, and I've got people that uh, and I'm also offering just uh, advertisement in the film, blah, blah, blah. And there are different types of advertising, and one of them is having your name in the credits. Oh, I mean, when I pitched it, the, I was like, the guy was like, Oh yeah, that's cool. How much do you want? <laughs> and I yeah, should have said a bigger number, yeah, but yeah, no, that's always <laughs> every time I've said a big number and they go, yeah, sounds good, and I'm like, ah, fuck, I should have went bigger. <laughs> uh, so yeah, <laughs> whatever. You just learn that for the next one, right? Uh, uh, no, I think that a lot of people listening that are going out and just, I mean, because you, you, you read a ton of books that, and like, first-time filmmakers are always like, I went to, you know, my friend's dad that was a dentist, and and he came on, you know, because it's like 20 grand to him was nothing. Right. Um, and he's like, I'll just basically give it to you as a loan. It's like, I just want 5% back. I don't want any of your movie. Like, knowing that chances are you're never making your money back. Right. It's just he's helping you out. Totally. It's a write-off. Um but man, yeah, I'm gonna think about that for just future projects when I have to sell sell finance, which is most of them. Because <laughs> yeah, because at the end of the day, you know, what you lose is nothing. If they say no, they say no. But yeah, if you didn't ask, that would have been a no. It would have right? still been a no. You'd still be at zero, so you might as well ask. No, I, that's that's great. So so deadly revisions came from was that mostly you just kind of like pounding the pavement, looking for corporate sponsorships, self-financing, asking friends and family? All that. Okay. Crowdfunding even. Okay. Did you do Kickstarter or something for that one or? What did we do for Dead the Revisions? Because that was like five years ago. Uh, yeah. It was so. either Kickstarter, Indiegogo, okay. I forget. Um, and I think at the time, maybe Horror Society even 
was trying to get into the game, and I think we tried to use them too. I can't remember. Okay, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I'm trying to think who the big one. I think yeah, Kickstarter would have just probably been starting at that point five or six years ago. Yeah, so I think they were both around. Yeah, though, because Indiegogo came up pretty fast. Yeah, but uh, yeah, like I said, I don't remember. I, I have to look it up. Okay, <laughs> um, not super important. But what was one of the pitfalls with doing? Like after, so you had everybody, did you go to these corporate sponsorships and stuff first, or did you go to something like Kickstarter, get the money and then see what else you needed? Or was it one of those films that you're just like, I'm going to make it with whatever I end up with. Oh yeah. I was, I was, (laughs) it was, it was, we had all, once we had got the whole setup and I had Roxy with my, as my co-producer and I had Bill signed on to be the lead. I was like, okay. And then I knew I was going to have Cindy. I'm like, okay. Um, this is going to happen one way or the other by hook or by crook. So then I just started trying to figure out how do I make it happen? And it was just a matter of we're making it happen one way or the other. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't know what I did first. <laughs> you had the producers on board and you, Bill Oberst Jr., right? Was, right. was the lead. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the, cause he's pretty big in like the indie horror game. Yeah. Um, so did you just reach out to him or we how had, did you get him attached for Deadly Revisions? We had actually met uh, before then at a, what was it? It was like some kind of conference, not a conference. It was a, I don't know. He was speaking about something. I don't even remember what he was speaking about. I think it was acting or something. And I, Cindy, I, I knew Cindy. We had done a project together, and she knew Bill. So she said, come with me to this thing, and you'll meet him. He's really nice. Okay, so we went. That's how I met him. That's also actually how I met Donna, because she was in the audience. Okay. Um, so I forgot about that. <laughs> and uh, And he and I just clicked. And so we ended up exchanging numbers, and then we would get together and have coffee and talk about movies and blah, 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 blah. And then... When with the, I, I approached him with the this uh, we were trying to write something for the three of us me and Cindy okay. and uh, Bill and I wrote something and we couldn't decide what where which way to take it and went round and round and finally I thought you know what I have this script that's a feature that would be perfect for you and I gave it to him and I go what do you read it what do you think and he read it he goes oh my god I think it's great but I think you should play the lead and I went oh, no you <laughs> should play the lead. <laughs> And he said, well, yeah, I would love to. So then I showed it to Roxy, and Roxy read it, and she said, oh, this is great. We should do this. And I said, yeah, well, Bill wants to do it. She says, oh, my God, really? Okay, well, let's go. And, and it just sort of snowballed from there. Yeah, so yeah. I would say networking is the answer, maybe. That's how we met. No, I think that's a good answer, Like, because everybody asks, you know, what came first. And I think it's just you start – it's like, for one, you start telling people you're going to make a project – that's like step one. Yeah. Even though a lot of people are like, I don't want to talk about it till it's ready to go. And like, I talk about films when I'm still in just development. Like I haven't written anything down. Um, because it's like, if I start talking to people and tell them a little snippet, then they're like, Oh, that's a cool idea. And yeah. if you hear that from like a dozen people, you're like, I should probably write that. Like, <laughs> you know, it's just like, okay, ah. it's getting a pretty good feedback. I should go with it. Yeah. Um, and I think, especially with my newest feature, like that's what we did. I just like, told a DP that we were going to work together. We were trying to find a, a project to do. And I told him the idea and he's like, that sounds awesome. Let's do it. And I was like, Oh really? I was like, I just thought it would exist <laughs> in my head. And, um, and then we made it and now it's in post. So I think okay. that's the part is the networking, getting other people around you to believe in it as much as you. Um, Definitely. and then it's just somehow things just come together. And, and it sounds like too, if you can make it for lower budget or you can be willing to, to, to pound the pavement, like with this corporate sponsorship, which I'm probably going to use for a project in the future. Like, I would have never thought <laughs> Feel to just free. Like, yeah, it's like all these small businesses I know back from like my hometowns and stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, it's... Especially people that are like in another state that yeah. they're so far removed from Hollywood. They're like, really? You mean I can, my name can be on the screen? That's exciting. Yeah. Uh, maybe less so now that crowdfunding is so huge and that's so common. But, but I think even with the crowdfunding, I try to stay away from like the Kickstarters. Like we use Seed and Spark for our mm. for This Is Us, um, just for post sound. Like okay. we, we were like you know about five grand short. We decided to do a little one, right? And to also as like our first kind of wave of sharing the film with people because it mm-hmm. was like it was done. Right. So we had a product. We weren't asking for people to come on with nothing in hand. Right. 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 Um, but I. Th- 
yeah, for the most part, though, I try to stay away from it because it's like there's so many of them. Uh, well, there's so many projects for one. Right. Um, and it gets, you know, you probably get a dozen a month from people you know being like, support this, support that. Um, and I right. think coming in with like kind of a finished product or at least something and then asking for it is probably a little easier sometimes. Uh, yeah, I guess it just depends. I don't know. For for those of us who are in the industry and we see those things a million times, it's like you can't, you almost have to like sort of plug your ears. Well, you just can't. I can't help because you can't I help can't, everyone. Yeah, if right. I, if I do, I'm going to be poor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, exactly. Yeah, I just can't. I can't donate to everybody. Or exactly. I now I'm going to have to ask people to donate to me because I'm I'm out of money. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, okay. So the movie went into production. You know, by hook or crook, as you said, you guys got there, you made it. So Deadly Revisions is done. Um, you're through production. You've had screenings. You've done festivals, everything like that. Um, what was the distribution challenge? Or did you get offers because of the festivals? Because who was attached? Like Bill Oberst, I mean, um, if nobody knows who we're talking about it, if you've watched an indie horror film, you've seen Bill Oberst. It's not, I think he has like 200 likely. credits on IMDb. <laughs> right. I mean, he's been in a lot of indie horror films. You've yeah. seen him in something. So um, that is a recognizable name. Uh, was that was that good for the film? Uh, well, yes, of course. Uh, as far as distribution goes, I think it was more um, festival award recognition that I think, because I could put I could put out press releases about that, and and that would get attention. Um, so I did get some bites, and there are you know all the horror stories about distributors, blah blah blah. They're not all untrue, <laughs> is how I think I want to phrase that. Um, it's, a, it's a very polite, <laughs> and so. Uh, I ended up going with the distributor that was actually recommended to me by a filmmaker or, hmm, I'm trying to remember who it was. I would like to give credit to whoever recommended him. But anyway, when I, when I, it was SGL and I, I looked at their site and I thought, okay, they're legit and they do, they focus on horror. So that's good. And, and then I contacted the guy, and the guy was like, well, yeah, send me the movie. So I sent him the movie, and he watched it, and he, he loved it. And he goes, oh, yeah, I would totally love to do this. And I said, okay, well, let's talk. And we talked, and he was just such a real, down-to-earth person. There was none of that, were we talking about this online or, or before the podcast about the people with the I think crazy, we were just talking about it right oh, before, and it's just like, right. you're going to be famous. Yeah, You're-like, those crazy people. Gonna be, ah, this is going to make millions. Yeah, gonna, this is going to be great. Well, I'm going to put it all over yeah. the world. If they start talking to the 1950s voice, like, yeah, you're going to go yeah. fuck, kid. It's like, no. Yeah, it's so, like, yeah, so this is just, everything was very real and very upfront, and I got the paperwork because I'd gotten paperwork from other people who were offering me stuff, and I was like, oh, no, <laughs> I'm not signed in that. And his was very legit, very straightforward. I understood everything and I was like okay there's a level of trust and I think that's huge because if you get a distributor that you feel you trust you can't ask for much more than that I think yeah because I mean even if you get uh, with Deadly Revisions was there anything up front was there any kind of up front like buy out or anything like that or was it just no. okay um because both of mine have not been that either and it's very you can work that sort of stuff yeah. and and corridor deals and all that jazz i think the the more the more films you make the, the higher films you get, you've yeah. made la la la, um, la. yeah but At i the think beginning that's, you're yeah. you're gonna be really god bless you if you can do it you know yeah but it's tough. I think the only way that's going to happen is if you get into like huge festivals, it turns into some kind of bidding war and more than one right. people and just be like, okay, well, I'll give it to you, but I need some money up. From yeah, exactly. Um, but then you could end up losing it because a lot of, you know, a lot of first time filmmakers, like you said, you don't have big names. Nobody knows who you are. There's no draw. Um, so just getting it out there is like, that's the success. Yeah, um, totally. <laughs> totally. Uh, you want that. You want, you want, as a first time filmmaker, you want the film to get out there. You want to get it on IMDb. You want to get it on Amazon. You want to get it out there so people can say, oh, yeah, he's legit. He's not making stuff up. <laughs> yeah, I, I think with like my first film with Autumn's In, when people were like, where can I watch it? And I was like, oh, iTunes, Amazon On Demand. Like, and, and they're like, oh, cool. And I was like, like a watch, real, you, like, like you, a real you movie. You watch it on your TV, like a exactly. real movie. And it right. was just, it just, elevated it even if you know you're not making 
like I'm not I'm not getting rich off that first movie. Uh, ho- hopefully, after people <laughs> listen to this, they'll go watch, watch Deadly Revisions and Autumn's End in our films. <laughs> right, and hopefully, you're making when you're making your first film, you're not imagining that it's going to make you a billionaire. That's and just, if you if are, that's you your goal. Uh, step back and um, take a breath. Yeah, 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 if you break even, I think on your first films, that's that's going to be way more success. Yeah, than- <laughs> totally, totally. You would like to make your money back, and that would be that would be a great goal. If you make profit too, even better. Yeah. <laughs> ha- have your ha- has Deadly Revisions broke even? You know, I would have to look at the paperwork. <laughs> I, I just, at some point, I stop paying attention to that. You know what I mean? It's like I get, I, I, get, way, yeah. I get my quarterly check and I put it in the bank. And, uh, you know. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I don't know the answer to that. And you know what? I should. I'm gonna have yeah. to. I'm gonna have to look that up. Uh, <laughs> so from from beginning to end, for people that are listening, uh, from like first day of production of like principal photography to when you could see it on Amazon, iTunes, all that kind of stuff. How long was that gap? Wow. I'm going to say close to, it's somewhere between two and three years okay. uh, each time. Because I, yeah, because it was like three years in between my making Daily Revisions and making Garden Party Massacre. And I think, uh, I think it was a good two years. Mm, yeah, at least. Because between how okay, long that sounds it, about right, yeah, that's about what it was for, yeah, both of mine from beginning to end. So yeah, because well, like for Garden Party Massacre, that distribution, where it that's taking a to me, and I don't remember how long it took for Dead Revisions, taking a long time to get a release date for it. I know it take it takes at least a half a year, or it seems six to nine months. It yeah. seems about what it's it was. Pretty, yeah. From the time you get like a contract to the time all the deliverables are done, and then whatever happens, or if the distributor gets cold feet and doesn't want to release it this month, and then it's like we're going to do it later. And exactly, um, you know, because with Garden Party, are they trying to do it around Halloween or anything? Just for I was put I was pushing originally yeah. for Halloween. Um, uh, but it looks like it, well, I'm still now. I'm hoping for Christmas. <laughs> I'm like, oh. now I just hope that it comes out. Yeah, but. because I, you know, because I'm using the same distributor. I knew all the deliverables, so even oh, when you the have film, the same distributor as as yeah. Deadly Revisions. Okay, so I yeah, like I said, I knew all the deli- so I had everything done way ahead of time. So when it was like, you know, because he said he was he had already hit me up way earlier said. You know, whenever Garden Party Massacre is done, I'm sure I'm going to want to represent, do it. Oh, that's great. Okay. So uh, I was like, okay. And I eventually contacted him and said, okay, it's actually done. Yeah, sure. Okay, let's do it. (laughs) Let's talk. And so we did. And um, and so I immediately, (laughs) like, I turned in the paperwork and I turned in all the deliverables because they were all done because I was that. And so that's, I was hoping that six to nine months, I was hoping for six. I think that's a huge, I think we're <laughs> that's a huge thing that I think filmmakers should keep in mind the the list of deliverables because I don't think a lot of filmmakers even know what deliverables oh, are right. going to be and every distributor is going to be a little different they're going to have right. certain things that they want mm-hmm. um, but for the most part like there's going to be a good fifteen or twenty things that are going to be the same across the board right um, and uh, if um, I'll, I'll put it. I'll put a link to some deliverables list from yeah. Like there's my lists contracts, out there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So you can see because I think that just having that could tie you up so hard, and you could get into talks, and then they want something you don't have, and then you do a price analysis on it, and you're like, oh my god, that's going to cost me three thousand dollars. And right. so I think you should just know up front because that could ruin deals for you. Yeah, and you want to put that put that those those costs in your budget when you're looking at those numbers. Now, okay, I'm going to need all of this. That's part of if you think if what think of it as part of post production is those distri- those distributor related fees that you might need to pay, like. Yeah, if you because you, you definitely don't want to let da, 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 the distributor da, da. pay for those and then take it out of your cut. That's gonna get real. <laughs> you can, you, can, you know, but... at the end of the day, to get the movie out, you do what you need to do. Yeah. and so I don't, I, I don't judge. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you can know ahead of time that stuff, it helps because I see all the time filmmakers complaining about oh deliverables, I hate them. They're da da da. I'm still working on them. I'm like. Oh, do that. Have that stuff ready to go. Just do it whenever your film's in, you know, festivals. Because at that point, you're not really doing that much for it. Your DCPs right. are made. You're just you're either going to the festival or not, depending on where it's at. 
Um, and it's, so it's like these little things like do one a day. Like it's not. And you're hunting a, for distributors or whatever you're just, doing. It's going to be just time consuming because it's like they need four different exports at different resolutions. And because, you know, they're going to want a 1080. They're going to want this, this, this. Yeah, and and then, the artwork for the DVD is not the same as the artwork for the yeah, Blu-ray. So you're going to have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just look at the size of cases. You can tell that they're not the same. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but they're going to want all that. And if you start letting the, the distributor do that and they take it out of your cut, then they start start making up prices of how much that stuff costs and it's just easier for you to work with your graphic designer or in most cases you yep. as the filmmaker <laughs> i design all my posters and yeah, um except yeah. for autumn's and the distributor redid all the the marketing for it and um oh they do that and, sometimes yeah so. and that was all like that wasn't a fee or anything they just thought it would be better um suited for it so uh but yeah that's that's good to know that the distributor is going to want a bunch of deliverables be prepared for it totally um so you also work a lot as a writer, just mm-hmm. exclusively, and you sell scripts. Mm-hmm. Um, is it heretics or heretics? Heretics. Heretics. Um, well, actually, I don't know if it's it's a British film. Maybe they say it differently. <laughs> yeah, because I was wondering how. Uh, yeah, how they say it. Um, but that's like blowing up right now, right? Yeah, that it just had its world premiere. Um, and Gregory wrote the film. Didn't star in it. I wrote the screenplay that it was based on. Okay. The director uh, and his has is, this is his third film, and he has a writing partner with whom he's written all of his films, and okay. so he rewrote the actual screenplay that is that is the actual movie that you see. Okay. It's the same story. It's still about a woman who is spared the noose by going to this nunnery to live a life of penitence and discovers the. What's going on at the nunnery is way scarier than anything else. Okay. So that element, that's still the story. Um, but exactly what's going on and why it's going on, they changed that. Okay. Um, and like names and things like that. And so. So you wrote the script. Did they then? Did they basically license it, or did yeah, they, they just bought, buy they, it, they just bought, buy it outright? They bought the rights to the script. The, okay. the production company bought the rights to the script, and then um, and then they found the director that went, ooh, that's the kind of movie I want to make. And okay. So then that's how it happened. Okay, so so what we're going to see on screen, you don't know how much of it is still your script. Oh, I don't think any of the... I'll be surprised if any of the dialogue, for example, okay. is the same, because, the, because, I, because I know what the evil in my version was and the evil that in this version is totally different okay so they would everything they would, would have, have to, to be different things. yeah so what what is that process for a, i mean is that is that weird that you sold a script that basically they just liked like this little nugget and then just rewrote no that's very typical people yeah. buy it people <laughs> buy it people will take a script because they bought an then, idea basically yeah and yeah. they'll rewrite whatever they want sometimes yeah. you know like in 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 Higher up the ladder, a lot of times you get a the the writer gets the uh, the the right to do the first rewrite. Okay. Not usually at the lower end of the level. So, um, but that was fine with me. I was like, whatever. You know, when 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 it was sold, they loved the script the way it was. They were they were thinking it was going to be made that way. Okay. Uh, it wasn't until they got the director attached. Um, because he loved the whole general concept and the period and all of that and the setting and uh, he loved all that, but he just wanted to do something different. Part of that, I think, might have been that he has extensive. Uh, I mean, he, he's um, he's just known for uh, makeup and SFX, okay. and so my script was not Heavy geared that. for that at all, uh, and so the whole. His version is the he taking that the supernatural ish element I had, turning it into the one he is using. There's a lot more of creepy stuff in your face. Okay, um, so it it became a vehicle that he wanted to create. So I'm kind of excited to see what all that is. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, because you hear yeah you hear it all the time like a writer role, and then they have a writing credit in there, and then they're like, that was not what I wrote because it's basically I sold them an idea, and, right? Um, and so that's good that you're just like yeah, like these the ones that I'm writing are not for me. Um, I'm writing them for somebody else, mm. and 
whatever they do with it is that. So that's, I mean, I guess that's a good way to think about it. And, and you're able to disconnect that you're like, they're going to do whatever they want. I'm, oh, yeah. yeah. My, well, my, my job is over. <laughs> yeah. When I write something, I'm just writing it because I need to write the story and I want to write the script or whatever. And then, you know, maybe I'll make it or maybe I'll sell it. I don't know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I don't worry about yeah. that. You know, do you have an agent? For, for I writing? do not have an agent for okay. writing right now. In fact, I don't have an agent for anything at the moment. Okay, so I'm yeah. totally f- unfettered. <laughs> so with something with Heretics, how did you get in touch with that production company? Or was it just a previous connection you had? No, no, no. I think if I remember, I don't remember exactly what happened. I don't know if he approached me or I approached him. I had won Best Screenplay. Um the original script, uh, in, a in a horror competition. And I think just putting it out there and doing a press release about it, I guess it drew this guy's attention. I can't even remember. Um, that was the producer. That was one of the producers. That ended right. up buying it. Correct. Okay. Correct. And so, yeah, I, I don't even remember who, who, who hit up who first. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Was so long ago. So Gosh. as far as the, uh, I mean, I see a lot of, I mean, there's a, a billion festivals for screenplays or shorts or online, da, 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 like the list goes on and on. Um, but for a screenplay, like for a screenplay competition, um, what what were your thoughts on that whenever you like submitted? Because I've seen them before and I, I mean, this seems like a success story if that's uh, yeah, kind of yeah. where it came from because you won an award from it. But um, what would you vouch for them or do you think they're a, a good thing or... <laughs> he said chortling um anything can be a good thing uh, that that Man, i that would was say the best answer <laughs> uh, um there's a lot there's a lot of competitions festivals i think that are more about the, the creators of the festivals making money than it's about anything else um unfortunately but there are opportunities, and I think, for example, when I if you win the Nicole, or even if you get a quarter finalist, I've been a quarter finalist, I've been a semi finalist, um, you get lots of attention. Agents are like, "Ooh, I want to read that script. Ooh, send me that script." And send what exactly that was that? That's the, the Nicole. That's through the Academy. Okay. Um, and there are a couple of others that are like the higher echelon. Uh, screenwriting competitions those will get you decent attention uh, from legit buyers and or representatives similar to in film festivals you know toronto sundance you're gonna if you can get it if you can get in those yeah. the, the, the big seven or whatever they are you're gonna get attention from major players yeah. but even if you get something at a smaller one it can translate into something, which is the story behind heretics. So okay. you never know. No, I think your answer to that, you can make a positive out of any of these things. Um, and because submitting to film festivals, once again, that should be in your budget. Oh, yeah, because, because by that's time a at the lot end, of it's money. A, it's a lot of money. And I think a lot of filmmakers forget about that line item. Because, I mean, for just for my first feature, we, I think, spent over $1,200 on film submissions. Mm-hmm. Um, and ended up getting into one festival. So it's like, it's a lot of money. And you're like, if you think of it as down the drain, granted, we, you know, we premiered at Dances with Films at the Chinese Theater. Like it was a huge festival. That's huge. Um, yeah. And then we ended up, but so it was worth it. And then the same with the second film we submitted to, <laughs> I don't know how many, uh, but we got into the Rebel Film Festival, which now sponsors this podcast. Oh, hey. I teamed up with them. <laughs> hey, Rebel. <laughs> and then, uh, and then we premiered at Rain Dance in London. Oh, and then, nice. And then ended up getting, so it's. All of these, I don't ever think of it as like wasting money um, because whenever we didn't get into all the other ones, I was like, oh, those were a waste of money. But then you end up. So it's just it's all perspective of thinking because it's all part of the game and you're going to spend the money. So just be I think just be prepared to spend it. And then also the travel costs associated and stuff. So, yeah, if you're um, actually going to make an appearance. But it sounds if you're a screenwriter, like maybe these screenplay festivals that are that actually are getting noticed is probably worth the 20 or $30 to, to gamble and, and, right. and see if what happens. I think that's, especially if you haven't gotten anything produced as yet, you need to that's get your name point. out there. So f- 
any way you can get your name out there is good, I think. I would be wary of, you have to decide, I was just on a, I'm on, you know, in a lot of groups and whatnot, somebody's talking about the cost of a film festival or the cost of a competition or whatnot. And so you have to decide what cost you're, you think is acceptable. You said 20, 30 bucks. I mean, I see them for 50 and 70 and, yeah. and, and, and 100. I mean, it's 120 and, to submit to Sundance. So if, you, have like, to, you have to decide, okay, is this festival worth that money or not? I know some filmmakers who don't do any festivals at all, which, you know, is, is daring, I would say, especially when you consider even the big ones. I mean, major motion pictures go to Sundance, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So granted they probably don't pay. <laughs> right. Of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, you know, to eschew the whole thing, I think is it's not something I would necessarily do. But I would say, like with distributors, at film festivals, all of those things, it's about being discretionary, really doing your homework. I always put just a budget on how much I'm going to spend on the festival. So like, say it's a thousand dollars. That's how much I'm going to spend on submissions. Cause that's what I can afford. Yeah. So then, then you'll then, research, yeah, then you who's, research yeah. who's, what festival is really going to be good for my film. You yeah. know, if I make, uh, uh, if I make like garden party massacre, okay. That's a horror comedy. Uh, probably, I think I, when I was looking at things, I'm like, okay, it's got to be either a horror or a comedy centered. If it's going to be a smaller festival, yeah. a smaller regional festival, it's got to be something that they're going to want to see that and they're going to want to slate it. Uh, if I was going to do generals, I would aim for the big ones. Why not? You might get lucky. You might get lucky, yeah. Your film might be that good. Who and, knows? Yeah. And, and, and worst comes to worst, you're going to get your rejection letter from Sundance, and I have one, so right. that's cool. So there you go. <laughs> the first time you get rejected from somebody yeah. really cool. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, It's like, <laughs> all right, I'll be back. Um, but yeah, no, I just think that it's, it's definitely making sure that the festival it's going to play at it actually wants it because you get into the, some of the bigger festivals, they're going to be counter-programming your movie. So if you're up at seven o'clock on a, a major day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and there's going to be three other screenings, like, is anybody coming to your movie? Or is it better to be right. in a little bit smaller festival that they're really going to, you know, want make a big deal, to make a big deal movie. out of it. And so, um, cause I just realized after both of my films, not getting into a lot of festivals, it was more of just the quality of the, the one or two that they got in that made it worth it. So as opposed to playing at a hundred that nobody knew of. Oh, sure. Because um, in some festivals, as you said, there's, yeah, there's the, they have more there's than probably 500 in LA. Say, Gee, should I go see this new independent film or the Ryan Reynolds film? Uh, you yeah. know, it's so you, you yeah. know, there's that kind of competition. When it's still $15 for both of them. Right. Yeah. Or, or I'm going to, oh, I'm playing at this festival and nobody shows up. Yeah, or, which is uh, going to happen. Like, which is going to happen. You're going to play to a room of three people, mm -hmm. but those three people wanted to see it. So if one of those excited. three people is important, <laughs> you yeah. never know. And you, you just don't know, know who's there. So um, do you try to go to most of your festival screenings? I, if I can, um, yeah. it, it's a very, I think, because here's the, here's the thing that I think is valuable about festivals that almost has nothing to do with your film is the networking and getting to know people and meeting people. And, and because that I find is extremely valuable. I end up connecting with so many people at the festivals and, and, you know, if they're working on film and, and I have people now that I'm, that are part of my I consider part of my filmmaking world that I met at film festivals that I would never have met otherwise. Yeah. So I, and that's huge because they could be like, Oh, you know, in fact, now that I think about it, the film I'm shooting next month, next week, uh, I met the director chase at a film festival. And then that turned into him casting and you and that something turned into and, him and you're flying to me. Kentucky for it. Like it's not like a local thing. It's, it, it's at all. Yeah. Right. Um, no, definitely that networking thing. I, I've noticed that at film festivals a lot that it's, it's uh, the, the support is kind of tough 
because there are so many filmmakers there and everything like that. Like right. when I go to a film festival, I try to engulf myself with the films. Like I go to three or four a day. Definitely. And, um, and so you try to do that as well? Yeah, because that's how you get to see people's work. Yeah. You, might, you, might, you don't know this person from Adam, right? Yeah. And then you go and you watch their film and you're like, I remember the first time I went to uh, the Fantastic Horror Film Festival, there was a film called The Wretched. Uh, it's Rick, Rick Greenwood's film. And it was so great. I had just walked up to him afterwards. And I said, anything you ever <laughs> make, if you need my type, I'm in. I mean, have you worked with him? Because he's that good. I haven't, Not yet? I've done a reading for him okay, of great. a script that he's working yeah. on. But no, I haven't actually been cast yet. But that's okay. Yeah. You know, because he's, he's still aces in my book. And so sometimes you see, the, and the, then you know, this is a good filmmaker. I want to get to know this person. I want them in my And also, world. just like you said, it's that long game, too, of like, you haven't worked with him yet, but just keeping in touch and everything, because yeah. hopefully a filmmaker is going to make more than one movie. You hope. And, and then you keep going. And, and there's that, uh, oh, you know what? Mm, no, but I know this guy. Exactly, yeah. And because I've had that happen where some, you know, I get... I either I do that all the time. It's like, hmm, no, but I do know an actor that might work for you for that role. And so it's it's that. So the more people who know you, the more you you help everybody helps everybody. That's really what it's about. You hope everybody helps everybody. Well, all the, <laughs> the good people help. Yeah, exactly. All the good I think people. it's just yeah, it's weeding out the time vampires and like those kind of people that are just going right. to because you know let's like you know not to just be picking on dis there's bad distributors and bad film festival directors. There are bad actors and bad filmmakers. Yeah. And there's that your job has nothing to do with the quality of the person that you are. So Fair you have enough. to be a, a person of quality, regardless of what where, just a good what your person job is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, no. Circling back to that, going to watch films at film festivals. I think that's the most important. Um, and a lot of times I go to festivals, especially here in LA, and it's the director has only seen their movie at the festival. They haven't went and supported anybody else. Um, uh -huh. And like if any of the films I would skip, it'd be mine if I didn't have to do the Q and a, cause I've seen it a thousand times. Right. Um, so I just think get out there and watch these other films. Cause like when I went to rain dance, um, and then mm -hmm. when I went to the rebel film festival, mm -hmm. they, they had me over for my last film <clears throat> and there were films there that I got to see that nobody else is ever going to see. Cause that was probably their only festival. They're never getting distribution. They're done. So, I always think about it that way of just being like, okay, I'm going to get to see this film the best it's ever going to see and probably the only time. Yeah. Um, which is unfortunate, but a lot of these films are just not getting distribution. They're not going to be seen by a large audience and the filmmaker is going to get frustrated and they're just going to bury it somewhere. And it's like, I know. Uh, and that which hurts. is, like, yeah, which like <sighs> I saw a lot of really good documentaries at Rain Dance last year. And I'm sure most, like, there's going to be a couple that are never getting seen outside of that venue. So I think as a filmmaker, go watch these movies um, and su support the, maybe the one time that you're going to get to see them. Yeah. Um, and you never know. When you, when you, it may be the only opportunity you're going to meet somebody that yeah. is going to become very important for you someday. You or you for I mean? them. Or you for them. Yeah, I because I, I mean it circles back to just the networking and just I mean building that quality group of people around you that you know because it's not like that first connection it might be their third connection that they have they're like right. oh I met this filmmaker at a festival they came and watched my film was one of the six people in the audience stayed in touch like right and it's like it, it was a positive experience absolutely and, and you also got to see a really good film um, <clears throat> so whenever you're Going back to to the to the writing stage of it, if you're have you ever just collaborated with a director that's came to you and been like, I want to either license one of your films, but I want you to stay as part of it, or I have an idea, I want you to write it with me. Um, I've had I've had hmm, I'm trying to think if I've had exactly that. Um, I don't think I've had that exact scenario. I've sent people scripts and they've said oh can you do this with it instead and i do whatever it is and they're like that that's what i want or i've had people say oh i like this can i change it sure you know, if you're paying you, for you it buy, you know yeah. <laughs> you bought it you know, right you don't, if you buy it you don't yeah. even have to ask me you can permission. paint the walls you own the house now <laughs> <laughs> kind of yeah uh, 
you know, so I guess um, more of a question is like because a lot of directors are not writers, so they need to work with writers. Uh, gotcha. So what is like a filmmaker that I, I know directors here that are just like I, I would direct more if I had more more things to direct. I just don't write. I don't know how to approach that. What oh. should a director be doing if they want to approach a writer? Is a better question, a better forming of that question. Um, just f- approach. I mean, because I'm a director and a writer, so I'm like, you know, I just write my own stuff if I want. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, writers are happy to work. So I think that's that's what I tell what most of them, and, yeah. they're, and they're still just like, "Well, how do you find them?" And you I'm just, just like, "Oh, well, they're <laughs> everywhere." <laughs> Again, go into a Starbucks. That, right, <laughs> <give them> a, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> look oh, at the guy well, in the yeah, corner. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, I would say that's part of the networking thing. Is like you learn to pay attention to when you meet people. They're like, "Oh, I'm a director. Oh, I'm a writer. Oh, I'm an actor." And you, that's how you. I think that's how you do it. Um, as a, me as a director, be, I would probably almost exclusively at this point, I think, do my own stuff. Um, so I wouldn't go out to look for writers, but I have to go out when I'm, when I'm making a movie, I have to go out and look for crew and whatnot. You know what I mean? Like, like Roxy got me, uh, I ended up interviewing all these different DPs, you know? And so it's so kind Roxy of the brought same on thing. Nate. Roxy like she suggested brought on Nate. people. Yeah. Okay. She actually suggested several guys and I interviewed all of them and I really liked all of them, but it was just a matter of who had scheduling it's what I need. Oh, and scheduling. Yeah. Yeah. One guy was having a baby. (laughs) I was like, Oh, that's exactly when I'm making my movie. (laughs) Bad, bad timing. Um, I think it's another thing for filmmakers and creatives in general. If you don't get the job, it might not be because you weren't good enough. Oh, that's huge. It just might be because the timing didn't work out. And and that can be really frustrating because most people aren't going to tell you why they didn't. Um, but you're, you're hearing from somebody right now from Gregory that's saying, you know, (laughs) because this is something I think that actors always know is because we're auditioning constantly on and on and on and on. And a lot of times you don't get the job because of something that has nothing to do with you. They basically go, Oh, you know what? We cast the wife and she looks like this and this guy does not look like he belongs with her. It's just, I don't, I don't buy it. So you don't get cast even though maybe you were the best actor. Yeah. I've even just said it's like you walk in and the casting director, you look like their ex and they're like, nope. Yeah. Um, It doesn't have, it doesn't have crazy stuff. It's just like, or the lunch was late. Like they're just frustrated because they're hungry. Like there's things way outside your control that you, like you, you can't fix. You can't fix. Um, And don't worry about it. You go in, you do your best job and you go home. That's, yeah, that's, that's all. That's the only do. thing you have control of. And it's kind of the same with writing. You know, you write your script and you write it the best you think it can be. And you, whatever that means, that may mean, you know, paying for script notes and doing lots of readings and whatever your process is to make sure you think your script is the best it can be. And then you put it out there and people either like it or they don't. Yeah, you can't worry about what the yeah. yeah. You can't make everybody like it. You can't make somebody buy something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what what are your thoughts on script notes like paying for something like that? Well, I actually do script notes. So okay, so I think you it's love it. great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. Again, I think there are people who are really good at it and there are people who are not so good at it. Um so it depends on it, it, it can be a wonderful thing. I've yeah. worked with uh, I have a repeat client. Um He's, his writing just keeps getting better and better and better. Because um, I definitely think you need people to read or like when you get your film done, you need people to watch it that aren't you because absolutely. you know all the answers because you have the inside out of it. You Not only do but, you don't know, have all the answers, but you've looked at it so much that you stop seeing some things yeah. because you've seen you explain it, you the problems over in your it. head. And <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like, no, that makes sense because of this. And it's that. like, right, the, and the typos or whatever. Yeah, those just like, words whatever. You're, just, you're just never going to read that. Where is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So you need that stuff. I, you know, I... My other half, often, uh, whenever I finish something, I make sure that uh, it gets read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you know... Yeah, I always all, have my wife watch films before. Always catch, like, yeah. always catch, you know, the typos I've missed. Yeah. Always. Or just being like, does this make sense? And they're like, absolutely not. <laughs> like, Perfect. All right, cool. I'm, I'm going to go back to the office. I'll be back in a couple of <laughs> yeah. So I just think you do need that outside viewpoint and um, paid or not paid. Right. Um, but definitely, if you can get someone who 
kind of knows but, their stuff. Yeah, but you also it's need like yeah, like a working helpful. writer or somebody that you know. It, it's good to hand it off to friends and be like, "Do you understand what's going on?" But if you're trying to sell this to a producer, the typos they're done. You, like yeah, these little things, that. like they seem so small, but like when you're reading a thousand scripts a month. You're gonna throw it in the track. Totally. When they they're if they've got a pile of scripts, it's like okay, it's ninety pages, ninety pages, one hundred and twenty. That's going in the maybe later pile. Yeah. It's because they're looking for a ninety simple, to hundred page script. And... The simple stuff. They open the first page. How much white space is it? Is it? E does it look like an easy read? All that stuff that is is actually completely unimportant, but means the difference between they're gonna read your script or not. Because yeah. really, how much white page, how much white space is on a page, has nothing to do with how good that movie is going to be. Absolutely nothing. But it does have something to do with whether or not I feel like I want to read the rest of this script. So knowing and, those and kinds feelings. of things, yeah, knowing those, yeah. knowing those kinds of things is extremely helpful. So for anyone who's writing who doesn't feel they have a good grasp of all of those little tiny technical things that matter to a reader then it's really good to have somebody who knows their stuff to go through your script and see those things, point them out, show you options, how different ways to do things so that you can learn to do it yourself so that you don't have to keep getting notes over and over and over that you're Well, it sounds from, from a script note perspective, then you're somebody like yourself going through there, like, I'm not telling you how to write your story. I'm telling right. you how to make a better screenplay. Correct. That way you can sell it. And I think that's because a lot of people that take notes, they're like, I would change this and I'd make the person older and this. And it's like, that's not, I don't think that's not helpful to a writer. No, I because totally you don't, agree. I don't need you to tell me how to rewrite my story. No. I need you to tell me how to make this the best screenplay to be a producible thing. Exactly. The only time then I... Some, then a producer that's going to pay me can tell me to change that person after they bought my script. Right. I don't talk about too much about uh, changing story elements unless they're totally confusing or they make no sense. Things like that. Yeah, Things absolutely. that you would say you would want anyone to point out. Yeah. Just... But yeah. So uh, my goal when I'm doing script notes is to give somebody the information and enough examples that they can keep and have in their toolbox so the next time they write a script they'll we don't have, have to all talk that. about it again and we don't have to talk about it again yeah yeah. yeah that way i mean otherwise it's like i fixed your script that who cares that's nothing i yeah. don't want i don't want to fix your script and also, i don't want to make their script your script right i don't want to just fix their script i want to teach them so that they can fix their own scripts yeah so i guess approaching it as a teacher so if you're looking for script notes find somebody that's like a teacher that is actually helping right. not just being trying to make your script their script n n right not just <laughs> not just you know taping something together but actually yeah. giving you tools yeah. and be like i would place it here and it's like i but i didn't just <laughs> yeah um i i saw on whenever you filled out like i have everybody fill out this little questionnaire to just you know basically catch me up on what they're doing um and in your plug section, you had like all the projects you're working on, including films that you're just acting in or, um, and it, it got me to thinking, cause this podcast kind of came out of a necessity that I wanted to build a bigger community. Cause I think that's how we get other people to watch our films. Sure. That's because we're our biggest champions. Like if okay. we can get our group to run forward and be like, go watch blah, blah, blah's movie. Oh yeah. Um, because like a distributor, if you're not making a lot of money, they don't really care. Yeah. Um, and all those kind of things. But I noticed that you had all these on here. And I wanted to ask you, do you think it is important for actors to be champions for the movies that they're in? <laughs> that seems like a, uh, don't take this the wrong way, that seems like a crazy question to me because the answer is so obviously yes. But I think, but but just seeing this here, like even interviewing actors, things like that, um, and I've even noticed it with, with you know, films that I'm part of and everything. It's like you said, it's like a three year window. Like from right. the time you filmed, if they're only an actor, they were there for a couple of days. Possibly, after two yeah. and a, after maybe one day, maybe an hour. Right. After right, two right. and a half years, do they really care anymore? Because they've made their money, they've moved on with their life. Um, I that's just thought an, it was really a, great to see. Like you have, um, like you haven't even have Cyborg's Universe. Have you even started filming that one? Yes, the pilot's done. The pilot's done. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then Fang hasn't even came out yet, but you're you're still supporting. Uh, yeah. Heretics hasn't come out yet. Like yeah, it's yeah, and yeah. and but I was like okay. Like, I think actors, and I even talked to another producer friend of mine, and he follows a bunch of celebrities, just like ghosting them on Instagram. Okay. And basically to see what they're talking about, and it's never about the projects they're attached to. 
Okay. Um, and I think because like those are like the extra people to be like, go check out the movie I was in really helps. And, it's, and, and so for you to say it's crazy that you wouldn't do that, I think more. Well, think about the bit. Think about the, the, the big celebrities that we all know. Whenever a movie comes out, they're always on the top, doing talk shows. They're talking about it uh, in wherever, all over, online, interviews, yada, yada. They're always talking about the movie when it's coming out because that's part of the marketing. Do you think they're the doing marketing. that, though, because their contract stipulated that they oh, needed in, to do it? in in many cases, that's yeah. true, yes. But I think you're... It it benefits. It's not just a benefit to the film and the filmmaker. It's a benefit to you too. I mean, it's a I, to me, it's a win win because oh, I don't understand. I just don't understand the mentality why you wouldn't do that. I think if you're if you're if you're an actor just for the money, which to me is hilarious. That's that's a funny statement. <laughs> it's a hilarious yeah, yeah, yeah. statement. <laughs> then yeah, you go in, you do your thing, you say your lines, you get your check, and you forget about it. And okay, there are some times when you're in a film that you'd rather forget once yeah. you see it. And I think it's okay not to be crazy promoting things that you think absolutely, no one will absolutely. like. But if you're like a, the lead in a movie. I think you have, <laughs> unless you really think it's awful for some reason, I really think you you do yourself a disservice to not let people know about it. Yeah. And, I, and, and so even if it's not in your contract, you just think, just you know, being I like, go watch my movie. It's part of your because that's unspoken a good spoken contract. It's part of a gentleman's contract. Yeah. We all filmmake. We've all worked together so hard on this film. Let's promote it. Yeah, Unless like now it's, it's garbage. Yeah, let's now it, promote it. Yeah, but now it's out. Like I mean, especially like because if you're the DP or you're the actor or whatever, and maybe it was your first film, and now it's distributed. Like that's huge for you as a DP Absolutely. because you're gonna want to do another feature, right? Possibly not just with this director. Definitely. So being like, you know, watch my first movie. It's on, you can watch it for free on Amazon Prime. You can watch it here. Um, and I, yeah, it's it just, uh, I, I've just noticed that with, it, it is tough to get people to talk about the projects they're in. And I wondered if it's kind of because of the gap in time um, that people just are like, it was two and a half years ago. I have no idea. Yeah. It's just totally alien. But no, it was just like it's it, alien I, to me. <laughs> I really enjoyed that, like you had these on here. Like you have your film that you direct and and you know act in. But then it was like you had three films that you're you know, and one of them and and Heretics. You're like they rewrote my whole script. So you're not even like yeah. I have a story. You credit. have a, you have a that's story credit, and and but you're still like that's my film. Like I'm still a part yeah. of that, and I want you to go watch it. Cause, Absolutely. Because well, he's go a great. Watch, he's a great director, yeah. and you know I support him. Um, um, he's if you've seen his first film was the seasoning house his second film was howl uh, another okay yeah yeah werewolf film it's super fun yeah super fun um so yeah i don't know i i just like to support people who are doing good work i think that's a fine place to end gregory okay. go support the people that are doing good work <laughs> support your network of people because they're the ones that are growing with you yeah um and if one of them passes on a job maybe they'll suggest you next time sure so support those actors and those filmmakers and uh gregory thank you so much for coming out i'm glad after oh. our couple of weeks of back and forth <laughs> we were able to make this happen um I hope everybody learned a lot and we'll have links to all those films we talked about below, all the uh, information we talked about. I'll put a link to some deliverables list with just like um, some blankets of things that you might be uh, in for a shock. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much for coming out, Greg. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode of Decide to Do It. If you liked what you heard and you want to learn more, please like, subscribe, and follow us on social media in the links below. If you'd like to support check out my Patreon page. On there, I'll have Patreon-only videos, links, and exclusive content that's only available to Patreon members. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week.